Dearly beloved EP family, good evening. I'm Reverend Vincent Lee, your EP moderator. Welcome to this year's Holy Week Convention. Thank you for tuning in to listen to the messages. Before we begin, I would like to say a few words of encouragement. We live in an unprecedented time, and this is an extraordinary way to celebrate the Holy Week. This is the first time in our EP history that our Holy Week messages were pre-recorded and posted online. I hope you will listen to all the three messages and be blessed by the Word of God in this extraordinary situation. The COVID-19 pandemic has gripped the whole world and world leaders are struggling to find an effective way to deal with such a life-threatening situation. When they consult the scientists, they are told to lock down the country to save lives. When they consult the economists, they are told to keep the market open to save businesses. But as politicians, they want to save both lives and money. And they know by now it is impossible. No matter how they handle the situation, they will lose both lives and money. So it is amazing to see that even with the combination of scientific power, economic power, and political power, modern societies are no match for this little virus. At this moment, one little virus is ruling the world, forcing people to stop gathering and stay at home. The whole world is being forced to rethink life as we know it, so as to survive and live safely and productively. This crisis has increased the significance of our Holy Week celebration because in the events of the Holy Week recorded in the Bible, Jesus demonstrated the true wisdom and the true power desperately needed in the world of COVID-19. This series of three messages entitled Jesus, a King Beyond Our Wildest Imagination is based on John's Gospel, which shows Jesus as a very different kind of king. A king who was anointed for burial, glorified on the cross, and was empowered to be vulnerable. You will find that the actions of King Jesus expose the futility of our fallen world and the vanity of its value system. I'm sure you will be greatly encouraged by the messages. May God's truth be our hope and peace today and every day. I now invite the chairman of the Holy Week Convention, Reverend Lee Kien Singh, to read the scripture, the, the, uh, the scripture passage. And after that, our vice moderator, Reverend Adrin, will introduce the speaker and uh, pray for all of us uh, before he delivers the first message. The scripture reading for this evening is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, reading from verse 1 to verse 11. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, reading from verse 1 to verse 11. And I'm going to read it from the English Standard Version.
Let us listen to the word of God. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. This is the word of God. Our speaker for this year's um, Holy Week Convention is the Reverend Dr. Simon Chan. Reverend Dr. Simon Chan is currently the editor of Asia Journal of Theology. He was formerly Ernest Lau, Professor of Systematic Theology at Trinity Theological Co College until his retirement. Reverend Chan conducts regular spiritual retreats for lay leaders for Trinity Theological College. Before we invite Dr. Chan to come and share with us God's word, allow me to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, during this time of the year and during this time of much uncertainty around the world and here in our country, we proclaim Jesus. We proclaim your Son, our Lord and Savior, by remembering his obedience, his sacrifice, his exaltation. And we remember him by looking at his earthly ministry when he took the form of a servant and gave his all for us on the cross, that we might be reconciled to you and made co-heirs with Jesus. And so we proclaim to the hope that can only be found in Jesus as we listen to your word preach tonight. Use your servant, Simon, we pray, and speak to us your word in Jesus' name. Amen. The fact that we are not gathered together in the usual way in this annual convention is a stark reminder that right now we are living under very abnormal conditions. The pandemic has severely disrupted our normal lifestyle. Some talk about a new normal after the pandemic is over. But is there such a thing as a new normal? From a Christian perspective, the world we live in is already an abnormal world. And if this pandemic makes us more deeply aware of its abnormality, then it is a good wake-up call. We cannot find the real norm in a fallen and fragmented world. But where else can the real new normal be found? I think it was Dallas Willard who says in one of his books that if we live in a world that is turned upside down, then the one person who is right side up will appear upside down to us. This is why 
Willard goes on to explain, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount sounds so strange to our ears. It makes seemingly impossible demands. It sounds so jarring because we are upside down and he is right side up. He is the truly normal person and we are the abnormal or subnormal. It is not only in the Sermon on the Mount that our serious shortcomings are exposed in light of the person of Jesus. This truth is brought to us in its sharpest focus in the Gospel of John. John's extensive use of ironies and double meanings exposes human superficialities, blind spots, and the repeated failure to grasp the true meaning of the teachings of Jesus. If his words don't make sense, it's not because they are too difficult, but because we are deaf. In this series, I would like to focus on the theme that highlights this phenomenon. It is on Jesus as King. If you go through John's Gospel, you will be surprised that in the first 11 chapters, which cover the entire public ministry of Jesus, there are only two references to Jesus as King. One is the confession of Nathanael in John 1.49 at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. The other is John 6.15, when the crowd had eaten their fill of bread and fish, they wanted to make Jesus King. But from Palm Sunday to his crucifixion, from chapters 12 to 19, there are 14 references to Jesus as King. That itself is ironical, isn't it? The truth of, of Jesus as King is most poignantly revealed at the time when he was approaching the hour of his death. Who has ever heard of the coronation of a dying man? Yet, that is exactly what John wants us to see, the coronation of a man about to be brutally executed. John portrays Jesus as king, but a very strange kind of king. He is a king who does not live up to our expectations. Why is that so? Because he is the only right-side-up person who exposes our upside-down world our distorted values, and our worldly ways of thinking. The revelation of Jesus as King begins on Palm Sunday. The event is often described as a triumphal entry. But even the triumph of the King is portrayed in a way that boggles our imagination. First, Jesus allowed himself to be hailed as a King the crowds declared, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Of all the Gospels, only John has the crowd hailing Jesus as King of Israel. But he is quite unlike any other worldly king. Jesus did not come riding on a war horse as kings would when entering the city of the vanquished. Rather, he came riding on a donkey and a borrowed animal at that. In today's terms, what kind of dignitary would go to an official function driving a rented, beat-up Hyundai? No offence to Hyundai owners. Yes, he is king, but not the kind who lives up to the world's expectations. 
the ways of God are not the ways of men. The thoughts of God are not the thoughts of men. This truth is well encapsulated in the words of the poet George MacDonald. They were looking for a king to slay their foes and lift them high. Thou camest, a little baby thing that made a woman cry. Over the next three sessions, I would like to look at different aspects of Jesus' kingship revealed in the final week of his life on earth, the period the church commemorates as Holy Week. In each, we will see that the Christian idea of kingship is very different from that of the world. First, the anointed king. Let us look at the context of the anointing of Jesus. Preceding the anointing, John describes the atmosphere as filled with tension and ambiguity. We read in chapter 11, verses 54 to 57, Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. John paints a scene of stark contrasts. First, there is the contrast between crowds converging on Jerusalem for the Passover on the one hand, and Jesus withdrawing into the wilderness on the other. Second, there were two contrasting groups of people looking for Jesus. One group came to the small village of Bethany, where Jesus was staying in the home of Lazarus. We read in 12.9, that they came not only because of Jesus, but to see Lazarus. The addition of the phrase, to see Lazarus, is quite telling. They probably came with mixed motives. The miracle may have won many over to Jesus' side, but in John's Gospel, the crowds believing in Jesus should not be taken too seriously, as in the case of the crowd in John 6, who believed when they had eaten their fill, but could not swallow the hard sayings of Jesus. Their wanting to see Lazarus suggests that they were driven more by curiosity than purely spiritual interests. I can imagine a conversation that goes something like this, as the crowd converges on Bethany. Oh boy, oh boy, I can't wait to see this guy Lazarus. It leaves me with some deep, unanswered questions. And what might they be? Another asked. Well, for one, how long did his soul hover over his tomb? Our rabbi says it's three days but Lazarus was dead for four days, if you get what I mean. Indeed, indeed, said the second guy, looking puzzled. You see, those rustic folks were just as capable of theological curiosities as are typical modern churchgoers. By the way, I'm not imagining those questions. You can find them in some rabbinic literature. 
That's one group, the curious crowd. Then there was another group who were looking for Jesus for a more sinister reason. We read in chapter 11, verse 56, that this group kept looking for or seeking him. The word seeking is used repeatedly in John to refer to the Jews seeking to arrest him. You find that in the references given. This is confirmed by the fact that an order of arrest had been issued by the religious leaders. They were out for blood. Jesus was placed on the wanted list. Perhaps it was already announced that there was a reward for information concerning his whereabouts. Then, following this bleak backdrop, John tells the story of the anointing of Jesus, followed by the triumphal entry in chapter 12, verses 12 to 15. The sequence of events in John's gospel, the withdrawing to the desert like a fugitive, being anointed, and culminating in triumphal entry into Jerusalem, is intended to point to one thing. The anointing followed by his triumphal entry is intended to show Jesus as king. It seems that John is intent on showing that the words and actions of Jesus were so consistently misunderstood, not only by the crowd, which is understandable, but also by his closest disciples. Let us first look at the crowd. John's gospel often portrays the crowd in a rather poor light. In chapter 6, we learn that after eating free bread and fish, the crowd wanted to make him king. They were only interested in a king as generous provider of free food and health care, a king who would set up a welfare state. Thus, we have in John 6 a crowd that was motivated solely by inexhaustible provisions. It reminds us of the Samaritan woman. Sir, give me this drink so that I won't have to come here to draw water. But here, in the household of Lazarus, we see a large crowd scrutinizing Lazarus out of curiosity. We understand if the crowd represents the vast majority of people who are only interested in religion for their own selfish purposes. But we read in John 12, 16, that even his closest disciples did not understand the significance of his entrance into Jerusalem until Jesus was raised from the dead. Now let us look at the anointing of Jesus. Like many other places in John, the anointing of Jesus has a double meaning. Kings are anointed, so are the dead. John in this story again conflates the two, thus showing Jesus to be a different kind of king. The normal convention of inaugurating a king would be, among other things, to anoint the potential king with oil. Oil would be poured on the head as a sign of the resting of the spirit on him. This was what we see in Samuel's anointing of David. Indeed, the spirit came on David from that day and he was able to do great exploits, killing lions and bears and Goliath. But in the case of Jesus, the anointing was not to inaugurate him as king to reign, but to prepare the king for burial. The oil was poured not on his head, but on his feet. It was not done by a prophet or priest, but by a woman. 
and a woman of dubious character at that. Instead of being hailed a king, he was criticized by his own disciples who thought that it was a waste of money. After all, shouldn't kings be concerned with the poor, the widows, and the orphans? Doesn't the law itself require of kings to care for the marginalized? How could a king allow himself to indulge in such luxury at the expense of the poor? The protest of Judas Iscariot may sound like the rantings of a liberation theologian, but from the point of view of the Torah, his objection was quite reasonable. If we were in that situation, I'm sure we would be quite shocked as well. Not only was there wastage, but the scene of a woman pouring precious perfume on the feet of Jesus and wiping them with her hair would have struck us as, to say the least, highly inappropriate even indecent. Some modern evangelical Christians would have a different complaint. We should be using the money to do mission work or hold an evangelistic campaign. I can imagine some modern church elders saying something similar. This is not good stewardship. But Jesus' response was even more enigmatic then the action of Mary, he says, leave her alone. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. In other words, there are lots of poor people you can help any time. But what she has done for me is a right and proper thing. Now, this sounds like the height of self-indulgence. But in reality, Jesus was pointing to something that would have far-reaching significance for the world, something that no one had foreseen. Soon, he would be receiving not a sprinkling of sweet perfume, but would be wrapped in 200 pounds of preservative and buried in a borrowed tomb. Whether Mary had some inkling of that event, we do not know. But her action was an anticipation of a climactic event that would send shock waves through the entire universe. His death, burial, and resurrection. The world will never be the same again because the king of the universe was anointed to die. Here is no normal king. If he were recognized as indeed the successor to David's throne, he would have been anointed by the high priest with pomp and ceremony. And then he would be leading his army to challenge the might of Rome. Quite clearly, John wants us to understand his anointing as preparation for burial. Yet following that, he tells the story of his triumphal entry with the crowd shouting, your king is coming. Jesus, by allowing himself to be anointed by a woman and then being hailed as king of Israel, shows us that his kingdom is not of this world. His kingship was not political. He was not sent to challenge Rome. He conquered, not by coercion or brute force, but by love and persuasion. And the only way he could exercise true kingship was by way of death. It was the way appointed by the Father. The whole scenario is carefully calibrated to reveal a profound truth. The king 
must first die before he can reign. He has to become nothing in order to fill all things. He has to become completely powerless before he is given all authority in heaven and on earth. The way of God is diametrically opposed to the ways of the world. Through death, he is to become a king far more powerful than any earthly king. He is the king who will conquer death itself. What can we learn from this enigmatic story of Jesus' anointing? Jesus did not come to turn the world upside down. The world is already upside down. He came to turn the world right side up. So, if the anointing of Jesus strikes us as strange, it's because we are not quite right side up. It is we who are out of sync with the kingdom of God. For example, how much of what we do is based not on the truth we profess to believe in, but on the conditioning of our culture. All too often, in the name of relevance, we do the work of God by adopting worldly means. We deal with people in church like the way we deal with employees in the workplace. We conduct church committee meetings like any other business meetings. We turn worship into a concert, preaching into motivational talk. Some pastors behave like little despots. Some lay leaders behave like CEOs. We have not stopped to ask ourselves, what is the Christian thing to do? The big question for many is, how do we get visible, quantifiable results? Here is a successful pastor who runs a successful program of leadership and discipleship. Let's follow suit, adopt the same strategy, and get great results. That's the mindset that pervades the church today. Nowadays, there's much talk about anointing. But when preachers talk about having the anointing, they have only one idea and nothing else. Anointing is about power. We hear it all the time. Here is a powerful, anointed preacher. Let's get him to run some revival or healing crusades for our church. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there's no such thing as powerful anointing for ministry. Jesus himself was anointed by the Spirit, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Acts 10, 38. What I'm saying is that there is also another kind of anointing that Jesus underwent that we have simply forgotten or ignored. It is an anointing unto death. By the way, this is a reason for the ancient practice of the church to anoint sick people in preparation for death. The anointing prepares the dying to face death. It's very unlike what we see in many modern church. People talk about how to be successful and live well. But you don't hear about people going to attend a conference on how to die well. Many Christians today are crazy over anointing so that they can do great things for God. But they are totally powerless when it comes to facing death, either their own or the death of others. When it comes to sickness, 
they try to spiritualize it away. This is spiritual warfare, they say. Or it's Satan's attack to undermine faith. Or you don't have faith, that's why you're sick. In our power-crazy world, there is no place for weakness. If you are weak, you are unspiritual. Jesus' anointing at Bethany teaches us another kind of anointing, an anointing to face death with courage. In allowing himself to be anointed, Jesus reveals a different kind of kingship. Kingship is not about brute force or power to do great exploits. Power comes from humble submission to the way appointed by his Father. It is the way of the cross. Are we prepared for that kind of power? Let us pray. Grant, gracious Heavenly Father, that we may seek to be faithful to your word, to see ministry not only as anointing to do great exploits, but also about preparing ourselves and others to face tragedies, pain, and death. We ask this through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.